So I think we are now ready to start. Hello, everyone. Good morning to those of you in Canada. Good afternoon to those of you in the UK. And good evening to those here in Asia. Welcome to LSE Ideas, uh, our Meet the Leader session today with Mr. Nahid Menshi, Mayor of Calgary. A few housekeeping points. Uh, the event is being recorded and we expect to publish it on our YouTube page in a few days. We'd also like this to be as interactive as possible. And so please ask questions on Zoom uh, using the Q&A function. And for those on Facebook, we'll also try and get to some of your questions. We'll be here for about 50 minutes in total so that we uh, can release the mayor at about 50 past the hour. Now, a little bit about our distinguished guest. Nahid Nenshi was first elected mayor of Calgary, the most populous city in Western Canada in 2010, which I think makes him, and not London's Sadiq Khan, the first elected Muslim mayor of a major Western city. He was re-elected in 2013 and again in 2017. In December 2014, the Guardian newspaper wrote a piece titled, Keep Calm and Nenshi On, How Floods Turned the Calgary Mayor into a folk hero, and I'm sure we'll come back to this. Prior to his election, he was with uh, McKinsey, later forming his own company, advising organizations in public sector, private and nonprofit sectors on strategy and policy. He's also a professor in nonprofit management at Mount Royal University. Nahid and I first met through the World Economic Forum. Both of us used to be members of the Young Global Leaders community and have bumped into each other or shared the stage um, at least in China, Japan, and Switzerland. There may have been one more place as well. Nahid, uh, welcome to LSE, and thank you very much for giving us time so early in, in the morning in your time zone in such a very busy period. Welcome, and thank Thanks you. Thanks so much, Lucy. And it's not that early. Uh, it's 8 o'clock in the morning here on a beautiful autumn day in Calgary. I'm thrilled to be here. I think you should have told the folks uh, what you told me just before we started, which is the last time you were on a panel with me and another politician. Uh, what happened to that person? Yes, that person is in jail. I'm really sorry about uh, <laughs> that. Nothing to do with me, but hopefully it's not an effect that uh, applies to all elected um, officials who uh, join me. Um, I hope not. But uh, thank you so much uh, for inviting me. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, looking forward to a conversation about leadership and my quirky uh, leadership journal, I should, uh, journey, I should say. I'll just start by uh, saying welcome virtually to Calgary. Uh, we're happy to have you here. We're here at the base of the Rocky Mountains, uh, at the beginnings of the Great Plains of North America in this vibrant city, the third largest in Canada, that is nonetheless going through the challenges that everyone is going through. A uh, global pandemic, a mental health crisis, an economic crisis, a crisis of reckoning on the issue of racism uh, in our community. So there is a lot going on here. Uh, but I always remind myself, uh, and it's very customary here in Canada, to start a conversation like this by reminding ourselves of the land on which we stand. And this is a land that, while it's in the new world, is very ancient land. We are here in Calgary at the confluence of two rivers in a semi-arid region. And for thousands of years, people have been coming to this land to gather, to hunt, to fish, to trade, to build wealth, to dream, to dance, to live, to love, to fight sometimes. It sounds like a city council meeting, except for the love part, uh, but ultimately uh, to build community. And so today I come to you from the ancestral lands of, of Nitsitepi, which means the people. We call them the Blackfoot people now, the people of the Siksika, the Gainai, and the Pikani First Nations. I come to you from the land of the Mountain people, the Ahe Nakoda people, from the Beaver people, the Sutina people. And I come to you from a land where for the last 150 years, we have welcomed people from every corner of this broken earth uh, to try and develop community and build humanity together. So I'm thrilled to continue that conversation with all of you today. That's excellent. Thank you so much. Maybe that's uh, it's a good place to start. Why is Canada, you know, what's top of mind right now? There's, I'm sure you've noticed there's elections taking place further down south. Are, are there? 
uh, apparently so. And what it happened? Looks like, it looks <laughs> like you guys are, you're sort of the good student in your in your dorm upstairs, and you've got the bad boys downstairs writing away. What is the reason that the the two of you seem so different? Is or is Canada actually a bad boy, and the image is a bit too positive from the outside? Let's get this out of the way, and then we'll come to your journey. Yeah, a terrific way of framing the question. It really is a bit of both. Um, as Canadians, we're very proud of what we have built here. You know, we didn't start in revolution. Uh, we started in evolution, uh, in, the, in the settler past of this country. And so we are very proud, but sometimes that pride can turn into smugness. And we have to be very careful of that because we certainly are not immune from the forces that are bedeviling our good friends and neighbors to the south, but also really people everywhere in the world. So yes, we can elect the first Muslim mayor in the Western world. And it's funny you mentioned that. I haven't had the chance to meet Sadiq Khan, um, but the night that he was elected, uh, my Twitter feed was full of people replying to him saying, no, no, you're not the first one. <laughs> right. But, you know, so we can elect a Muslim mayor of a major city but we still have issues with racism. In fact, one of the things that we're really trying to address right now is issues of how we go from being incredibly proud of what we've built here as a pluralistic multicultural society. The Aga Khan has called Canada the most successful example of pluralism in the history of humanity. But how do we reconcile that with the reality that particularly for Black and Indigenous people, but also for different people of color, that is not always true, that they experience a different Canada than many of the rest of us. And so we're trying to figure out that experience right now. How do we go from being multicultural to being actively anti-racist? Mm -hmm. And so fundamentally, that is where we find ourselves now. And, you know, a lot of us have been watching this uh, election results in the U.S. You see on social media and even talking to friends saying, wow, that could never happen here. And it's probably true that counting that never ends and lawsuits over elections probably wouldn't happen here. But I think that we are subject to a lot of the same forces of division uh, that we see in lots of pluralistic places across the Western world. Uh, we're just much more polite about it. And that may sound a little bit funny, but I've been thinking a lot about this. You know, a lot of folks who are interested in diversity really hate this word tolerance. And they say, you know, we shouldn't aim to be tolerant. So that's a very low value. It's a low bar. We should aim to accept one another, respect one another, and so on. But sometimes I ask myself, in fact, is tolerance the higher virtue? Because can we actually say, you know what? I'm never going to accept you. Maybe I don't like your religion or your sexual identity, but I'm not going to prevent you from having a good job. I don't mind if you live next door to me. And so... I think that in Canada, we have perfected the art of tolerance, right. but that is only so deep. And, you know, as everywhere, the COVID crisis has laid bare so many of the weaknesses of our society, the economic and social weaknesses of our society. And as such, what's happened to that veneer of tolerance? It's a very important and very difficult question. But like many, I believe that difficult times like this are times for creative thinking and the opportunity to be generative and build something better. That's very interesting. Is tolerance the higher virtue? I wouldn't have thought of it that way at all. In fact, here in Asia, the concept of, uh, um, of diversity is very different to, for example, in the UK, we talk about a melting pot. Everyone melts into something together. Whereas over here, it's more like a salad bowl. The individual components are still separately identifiable, but they play together. I believe that metaphor might actually be Canadian in origin um, because it's taking we've often, that as well. yeah, we've often talked about how the United States strives to make everyone American right. and we have had multiculturalism as a state policy uh, for nearly 40 years now. And so the fruit salad or the salad bowl is what we talk about a lot in right. Canada. Um, but, you know, the, the feedback on that, especially now is, maybe people need to melt a bit more. Right. Last question on this topic before we go to your journey. I noticed that last month you set up an anti-racism committee in Calgary. Last month. 
Um, why did you feel the need to do that now? Like everyone in North America and in many parts of the Western world, the George Floyd moment on May the 25th, coinciding with living through this pandemic and asking ourselves really basic questions about our community and our society and how we live, uh, has led to a moment where really one of three things can happen. Either this just fizzles away, as difficult as older social justice movements have, or it becomes something extremely dangerous. And that's what people are looking with a wary eye to our friends south of us are worried about. Or we use this moment to do really hard work, to actually say, you know what? We're not perfect. And this is a chance for us to think better about the work that we need to do together as a community. So when City Council set up that task force on anti-racism, they did a couple of other things. One is that they unanimously, and I've got a very politically diverse City Council, but they unanimously agreed to acknowledge that systemic and institutional racism exists in our institutions, particularly in our police. Uh, they set up this anti-racism task force to talk about ways that we can help the community move from being pluralistic to being anti-racist. But also, we looked at ourselves as an organization, as an employer, pretty big employer, $4 billion budget, 15,000 employees. And we said, how do we work to be actively anti-racist as an organization? You know, we hire a very diverse workforce, uh, diverse people driving the buses, picking up the waste and recycling, looking after our water services and our parks and so on and so on. But when I look at my top 50 managers, huge organization, in my top 50 managers, other than in acting positions, there is not one visibly non-white person. So I have to ask myself as the leader of an organization, who's been the leader for 10 years, by the way, how come when I have a management meeting, I'm the only non-white one in the room? How come we're very good at hiring a diverse workforce, but not good at promoting it? And these are, you know, tough organizational questions because they force us to come to terms with the reality of our values. Um, but we also said that it was important for us as an employer to set an example and to talk about the various barriers in place. The other thing I should say about this is we also had an unprecedented four day public hearing in the month of July virtually, um, where we invited people to just come and tell their stories. And it was an interesting place to be. And, and you know, as, as a Westerner person of color yourself, I think you're going to uh, resonate with what I'm about to say, which is, as people of color growing up in a largely non-white area, though in Calgary, one in three people are non-white, so uh, it's mixed. But as people of color growing up in a largely white area, we have made an explicit or implicit deal with the communities in which we live. And every parent tells this to their kids. It's just part of the deal. So it's part of the deal that when you go into a Walmart, the security guard is gonna keep a close eye on you. It's part of the deal that people will ask you, so where are you from? Even if your family's been here for many generations. It's part of the deal that they ask you if you know how to make good Indian food. And the return part of that deal is you get to live here. You get to live in a community and a society of unparalleled opportunity. So you put up with it. And, you know, the, the, the trendy term now is microaggression. Right. You put up with all these tiny things that don't really impact your life. And they're like being hit by a feather. But as somebody very wise recently said to me, you know what? A ton of feathers still weighs a ton. And sometimes they can be kind of pointy and you're putting additional labor on people who just want to live their lives. And maybe that deal needs to be re-examined. And that really is, I think, the fundamental part of how we talk about that movement from pluralism to anti-racism. I see. Okay. I think, um, I think I'll have a very good sense now of what success looks like for you. And let's go back in time to your first election to mayor. And if I may uh, perhaps ask you about your, your growing up experiences as well. How did you end up as an elected leader? Was that, were you always destined to be in that role? 
I mean, I deny it um, uh, all the time. And I say I stumbled into it. And I will actually give you the facts in a moment. Um, but at the same time, I grew up in a family that always talks about politics. You know, you were expected to know what was in the news uh, at the dinner table. We read the newspaper every day. Uh, for those of you watching under 40, a newspaper is sort of like an iPad that printed out, comes to your house. Um, and so I always started in that family, but let's go a little bit further back. Um, so my, my family is from Tanzania. Obviously, looking at me, you can see that I am Indian. I went to India for the first time this year, literally as COVID was starting. And uh, it was a great thing for me to tell. But, but the funniest thing, and this, since we just got such an international audience, I'll just throw this in. The funniest thing is that in India, I was all, I'm going to the land of my ancestors. And nobody recognized me as Indian when I was there. I'm quite fair-skinned. I don't have a typically Indian name and I'm from Canada and I talk like this. And so I'd have to start every speech with saying, my people are Kachi and Gujarati and say a few words in Gujarati or Kachi and they'd all go, oh. <laughs> but luckily my Gujarati and my Kachi are better than I thought they were. So um, that's good. But anyway, um, my family had immigrated from India to East Africa uh, some generations earlier and they had grown up uh, in Tanzania. My parents in the late 1960s were working in a place called Arusha, which is at the base of Mount Kilimanjaro. And then as now uh, has been used for a lot of international conferences, UN work and so on. Uh, I always wondered why until I visited there a few years ago for the first time and realized it's because on one side there's a mountain and on the other side there's a jungle with lions in it. So if you're there for peace talks, you, you, you can't leave the table. You're stuck there. Um, anyway. My parents met a bunch of Canadians uh, and they used to get the Toronto Star newspaper delivered to them in their diplomatic pouch. Uh, and my dad would read, get the star when they were done with it and read about this place on the other side of the world. And he became particularly obsessed with the new Toronto City Hall, which if anyone uh, has seen it is sort of a masterpiece of Scandinavian mid-century architecture. And dad was like, someday, I'm gonna go see that city hall. And some years later, he had the chance to get on a plane for the first time in his life. He was going to London, England for a family wedding to represent their giant family. And he thought he'd take a side trip to Canada. Oh, I see. I don't think they had Google Maps then. He didn't know how far it was. So he and my mom, pregnant with me, I always say I was born in Canada, but made in Africa, um, showed up in Canada and decided to stay because of the political and economic environment at home. Right. and went through a life of a lot of struggle, a lot of poverty, but also a life that was defined by service. In many South Asian languages, we use the word seva. And they really pushed their kids to be sevadaris, people who give service, service, or what I say, human beings. And so I grew up here in Calgary and, you know, went to public school, learned to read at a public library, explored the city on public transit. And even though we didn't have a lot of money, what I had was a lot of opportunity. I had a community that took a stake in me that wanted me to succeed. I graduated from the University of Calgary, uh, started my career at McKinsey, uh, did a bunch of consulting work all over the world, uh, and decided I needed to come home. So on the eve of my 30th birthday, just before 9-11, I came home, uh, eventually ended up being a professor of nonprofit management, the first tenured faculty member in that field um, in Canada, but always, always, always wanted to do more community related work. And so I did a bunch of activism in the small a sense of the word. You know, I was very interested in cities and how cities work and develop. I wrote a little book about the future of cities. I was on the media talking about the future of the city of Calgary. I wrote a regular column in the local newspaper and so on and so on and so on. And I taught my students about how they too could make change in the world. And eventually enough people said to me, you know, if you believe in all this stuff, why aren't you running for office? And I said, well, that's ridiculous. Politicians are good looking and charismatic and they talk in sound bites and they love babies and puppies and 
I hate all of those things. I just want to be a professor and read and write and talk about what change is needed. And eventually enough people said to me, you know what, what do you teach your students? You teach your students that you can't be a bystander. You teach your students that things can be better if you try and make them better. So what are you doing? So I'm a strategist at heart and by training. And so I thought, I sat, sat down and said, all right, can a goofy looking professor with then really long hair, um, who doesn't have any money or any name recognition outside of nerds who follow um, municipal politics actually launch a credible campaign. So we gave it a go. And we used our campaign as an experiment in civic engagement, getting people talking and thinking about the future of their community. And sure enough, one in a crazy uh, election that there's been a documentary film made about uh, and have been reelected twice since. But the most important part of that story is exactly 10 years ago, 10 years ago last week, my dad, just two years before he died, had the chance to wanted to see that city hall in Toronto, had the chance to sit in a city hall thousands of kilometers away and see his son become the mayor. Wow. And what I always say is that is an extraordinary story, That's but it's amazing. actually not. It's an extraordinary story in its details that every immigrant family in this country has that story. And so in some ways, it's a very ordinary Canadian story. And that's what I'm always reminding people that that is the place we are. Tell us a bit about the use of social media that was instrumental in your election. This is 2010, way before Donald Trump popularized it. How did you do that? Uh, what was exactly the social media strategy in those days? Well, a lot of folks think that social media is what got me elected in 2010. I take a slightly different view. Uh, and my view is that the oldest rule of politics is you go to people where they live. You don't expect them to come to you. And so because I didn't have any money in that campaign, um, but I had a lot of volunteers, a surprisingly gigantic number of volunteers, the most volunteers of any political campaign, uh, probably in Alberta history at that time, you know, 1,500 volunteers. Um, we, we had to give them something to do. So we went to where people lived. So we go to every festival. We go to parks where people were walking their dogs. Anywhere people were breathing the same air as their neighbors, which I guess you can't do anymore in COVID times. But just to talk about their dreams and their hopes for the city. And what we did when we did all that is we realized that a lot of people lived online and there were real opportunities to talk to people in communities that they were building online. And maybe in a second, I'm sure you're going to go there anyway, I'll talk about what happened to social media, which is horrifying. But back in those days, you know, you were interested in fly fishing and you always thought you were weird and nobody likes fly fishing. And then you found a bunch of people who love fly fishing that really affirmed you as a human being. And it turned out that a lot of people were interested in politics. And so we realized that you could use social media, not politics, I should say, their community. And my job was to make politics relevant to what they were thinking about for their community. And we realized that ironically, back then in 140 characters, you could actually have really authentic conversations with people. So my campaign manager famously said, that most politicians use social media as a television. They use it to broadcast what they think. Well, you and we used, it as a we used it as a telephone to actually have a conversation with people about what they think. Yeah. And that became really interesting. Um, I had, uh, I think I still have nearly a half a million followers on Twitter, even though I don't really use it very much anymore. Um, and in those early years before and after the election, I would spend a half hour, 45 minutes, an hour a day, just answering people's questions and when famously retweeting all the lost dogs and cats. Right. And here's the real secret of politics. Not always the cats, the dogs always come home when they get hungry. But if you retweet them, people think you brought their dog home. And, um, but, uh, but, you know, so we were doing a lot of those conversations and that was great. And then something changed. 
something really happened, um, which is, and, you know, I don't know if Donald Trump is a symptom or a cause, but suddenly those affirming communities that we had became very toxic. And it just became very difficult to reach real people in these real conversations. I see. And I can say a little bit about that. Um, I know there's some questions coming in and we encourage you to ask questions um, because I'll just ramble on about this forever if you don't. But, um, you know, the Cambridge Analytica scandal, I think a lot of people don't understand what that really was. What that was, was people who use very sophisticated uh, technology to figure out from your social media posts what your core values were. So depending on what you were interested in, what you were posting on, they kind of figured out you're either in this camp or susceptible to move to this camp. But then what really happened, and this is the part I think that's been a bit underreported, is they created artificial groups for people who you or I might call racists or haters. And in the past, these people typically didn't vote. They were kind of anti-government, anti-social, um, and they didn't see government as being something that was relevant to their lives. But what Cambridge Analytica and their clients were able to do was create groups that affirmed these values, that made people feel like they were part of a larger movement. And then they would seed these groups with pro-voting messages and eventually with pro-Trump messages. And so you saw groups that never voted before suddenly voting in huge numbers. That is why, in my mind, I'm no expert in this area, but I do read the internet sometimes. That is why, in my mind, the polls were so wrong in 2016, because they underweighted groups of traditional non-voters who were now voting. Right. Why they were wrong last this week, I have no idea. That's for the weeks and months to come. But ultimately, it fundamentally changed how social media works. It fundamentally changed our online lives, but it also changed our governments. And I don't know how we get out of it. So you'll see I've still got a half a million followers on Twitter, but you'll see I very rarely, it's not personal anymore. I've gone back to using it as a television. We broadcast things. I tweeted, come join me at the LSE conversation this morning. So, but I don't answer people's questions and I don't engage in discussion. And the reason is, because when a sincere person asks me a sincere question, a million, maybe real people, maybe bots, just jump in with abuse and insults. And it's just right. not worth it. And I don't mind the abuse and insults. Well, I do. It's not very nice. But I don't like when the abuse and insults are gone to someone who just sincerely wants to engage in a dialogue. It's fascinating how this has mutated from a telephone to a megaphone so quickly and in in the graph of your political career. Uh, now the que questions are coming in. I need to get some of my own questions through. So we're going to speed right. it up. Lightning yeah. round now. Your second time round, your 2013 election, you, you had a crushing victory of 74% majority. How did that happen? My exceptional good looks. I can see um, that. No, um, you know, uh, Canadians tend to be very generous to their politicians if they're doing a decent job. In fact, believe it or not, that 74% was a historically lower number than some mayors have received uh, running for their second term uh, in the past in this country. Uh, but we had just gone through, uh, as you alluded to in the introduction, a devastating flood. It's the, at the time the largest natural disaster in Canadian history. By the way, lucky, it's now the second largest natural disaster in Canadian history. And this summer, in the middle of the COVID pandemic, we got in Calgary the fourth largest natural disaster in Canadian history in a devastating hailstorm. So lucky me, um, I've got to be mayor through all of this. But, you know, the community really came together after that flood in a, in a remarkable and amazing way. And that could be a whole session on leadership. Uh, talking about what happened in that flood and how the community built leadership. It was, it was touching and remarkable and amazing. And people really at that moment felt that there was nothing we couldn't achieve together. And lucky me, I got to be the figurehead of that movement uh, where people, I think, put a lot of their great feelings about the community uh, onto me 
uh, which is a very exciting thing. Uh, and, you know, I, I, did, I did win an award as the world's best mayor as a result of all of that. But, um, but that wasn't really it. What it really was, was we tapped onto something and amazing how fast it changes because we tapped onto something that people said, we can get through anything, throw anything at us. We are resilient and we come together and we look after one another. And there was this remarkably positive feeling. And then 2016 happened. So I, uh, I actually remember that because by that time I was, I started following you on Twitter and you were working continuously around the clock and you were communicating throughout that time. And I remember there was one particular tweet about, I think you were warning people, don't go into the, onto the river yes. um, with some flowery language, you know, uh, uh, you probably remember it more than I do. I do. What was it exactly that you said? I, I, I basically, because people were trying to raft on the swollen river and it was just so crazy. And I was just so tired and I didn't want to swear at them uh, in the middle of a press conference. So what I said was something and it became a thing. It's still a thing. Hashtag Nenshi nouns. Uh, what I said was there are ma very many nouns I could use to describe you people, but I don't want to. So just right. get off the river. And that became a thing. So now in Calgary, it is a thing when someone's being particularly stupid, you call them a Nenshi noun. Right. Because you, it's pretty blunt language and, you know, you get away with that in politics. A lot of others may not have been able to. Uh, that Guardian article that I, I mentioned, there's a, and I quote the line, working and tweeting intensively throughout the week, he cajoled Calgarians not just to wait for emergency services, but to roll up their sleeves and help their neighbors themselves. The outpouring was such the city struggled to find enough jobs for all the volunteers. After it was all over, volunteers lined up to give the mayor a hug. Is this true? It is true. It is true. Um, and as I said, maybe one day we'll do a whole hour on leadership in crisis and talk about that. Yeah. But uh, I, there's so many stories, but it was just people doing things. And my job was to be able to allow them the permission to be able to allow their angels inner to shine. So very, very quickly, uh, there was a morning, you know, the flooding started on a Thursday. By Saturday, the waters were starting to recede and there was just horrifying uh, damage and devastation, $6 billion of damage uh, in its wake. And I was really trying to figure out how we could use volunteers to get involved in all of this. And there's a much longer story about public management in here, but I'll just uh, jump to the end, which is we invited people to come to the stadium parking lot early on a Monday morning, and we didn't give them any notice. Right. And my colleagues in the public service did that on purpose because they didn't want that many people to come because they didn't know how they were going to handle it. So they thought, you know, for day one, we actually won't give anyone any notice. We'll get a couple hundred people out. And uh, then that'll give us the, the info we need for day two and further days. And so I dragged myself over to the parking lot of the stadium. And there were thousands and thousands of people there. And the public servants were actually trying to send them home because they didn't know how to handle such an influx of people. There wasn't a PA system. There was no way to address the crowd. And so I stood up on a folding table and leaned into a fire truck that was parked next to me and used the speaker of the fire truck as a megaphone and just said to everybody, listen, there's no more room on the buses. We've run out of forms for you to sign. But then I took a deep breath and uh, visions of municipal lawyers and risk uh, technicians danced through my head. And I just said, but you know what? You know the parts of the city that have been flooded. Just go, just go help, do what you can. You may need to ask what's needed or it might just be obvious, just go. And they went and they went in the thousands and tens of thousands. There was a point where volunteers from Calgary went to a nearby town, ironically called High River, that had been very badly flooded. And there were more Calgary volunteers in High River than there were people who live in High River. Oh and um, so it was this remarkable sense of what is possible when we look after one another. And, you know, maybe I was the catalyst for it. Maybe it would have happened anyway. But it is always what I go to 
when I think about how we solve intractable problems, we solve them with the people in community. Amazing story. That's amazing. Um, we have about 15 minutes left, uh, uh, Nahid. Uh, let me take some questions from the floor before I come back to some of my questions. Um, there's one from Susan Lejeune. This is, uh, may not be related to anything that we've discussed so far. The question is, is Wexit really a thing? Oh, I should tell you what Wexit is. Yeah. Um, so Wexit refers to a separatist movement uh, in Western Canada uh, to separate from the rest of the country. So yes, it's a thing. Uh, no, it's not going to go anywhere um, because it's ridiculous in every possible way. It's ridiculous. Um, you know, some of the concerns that we have are the province of Alberta where I live is landlocked. And we've been having trouble getting access for particularly oil and gas to the coasts. So why in the world would we make it more landlocked? Because small population landlocked countries have been great examples of success in the world. Oh, wait, that's not true. <laughs> so, no, it is absolutely ridiculous. Uh, I'll fight it with every breath. But it is important to understand the very real frustrations on which it's based which is when you have a federation and a huge country like this, uh, it is easy to take parts of it for granted, particularly the parts that are less populated. But those are human beings. Those are real people with real dreams for their future. And it's important for us to think about them. So we've had a, we haven't talked about climate or energy. These are all things that are very important in my world. This is a resource developing region. We are very reliant on the Canadian energy sector on oil and gas which has really been stymied in recent years and gone through a long economic contraction. Um, in any case, um, but we've lost about 125,000 jobs in the oil and gas sector here. And as a federal minister from the province of Quebec on the other side of the country said to me recently, if we lost 125,000 jobs in Quebec or in Ontario, the more populous parts of the country, this would be an issue of national crisis the national government would be thinking about nothing else. And in the agenda of our government, and she's a member of the government, in the agenda of our government, this is barely top 10. Why is that? And, you know, so that does lead to people's real frustrations that other people don't care about them, particularly from a region that has been carrying the financial load of the country for so very long, that has been funding uh, social services across the country. And so now in the moment when the older brother who's been looking after the family suddenly falls on hard times and the family doesn't seem to be there for them, you can see where that frustration comes from. Right. I saw a headline that um, Alberta has shifted away from coal power over the last, uh, I think, 10 years. And it's credited to carbon pricing that you've had since 2007. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Do you have a complicated relationship with the climate change agenda, given that so many jobs are dependent? I wouldn't say complicated. I would say complex. So Alberta is often portrayed as sort of an anti-environment, anti-climate kind of place. Mm -hmm. And I must say that in recent years, in very recent years, um, there have been politicians who have seen pandering to climate change skeptics as a path to power. That's new. Um, in the 2014, 2013, we've had many provincial elections. In Alberta, since I've been mayor, I'm on my sixth premier. But um, in one of those elections, the right-wing party lost, partially because the leader was seen as pandering a little bit to climate change deniers. And now it's full fashion to do that. And um, so, but the reality is, as you say, that Alberta had carbon pricing. It was one of the first jurisdictions in the world that had carbon pricing. Nowadays, carbon tax is a dirty word in Alberta. The people forget we were there first. We just didn't do it as a consumer tax. We did it uh, as, a, as a levy on emitters. But in any case, um, so that movement away from coal has been an important one. Uh, the challenge is that our electrical grid here in Alberta is largely coal-fired. It's one of the remaining ones in the world. And so the transition from that coal-fired grid, the timing is challenging. Because if we were able to transition a bit later, we could probably transition directly to renewables plus storage. 
because we're transitioning now, we're transitioning to, in many cases, natural gas fired power, which is still a fossil fuel, though far more efficient and far less damaging than coal. Um, but it is going to lead to billions of dollars in investment that could get stranded as the world moves more to renewables and storage, which is one of those complex policy issues we're trying to solve. But just today or yesterday, and that's probably the headline to which you're referring, uh, one of our largest private utilities announced that they are exiting coal earlier than they thought they would. But that is tremendously dislocating for people who work in the coal sector, because remember, the coal is mined here and used here. Um, and so figuring out those economic dislocations and the very real pain that people are feeling is a huge challenge for us. Right. Um, I'll combine two questions into one. Uh, one is from Mr. Papon Islam from Calgary. Um, due to COVID-19, most people are working remotely. What's your strategy to protect commercial property in downtown area? And the related question is from Marta. Um, and she's asking, have your objectives and goals changed due to this pandemic? Uh, are your priorities very different now? Well, of course, uh, our short-term priorities are very different because our short-term priorities are keep people healthy and alive and manage both the public health and the mental health pandemic that we're seeing simultaneously right now. So, of course, that's number one. That's the most important thing. But I still got to run a city for the future. And this is the moment where I really, really, really wish I had a crystal ball because the question um, that is raised is a really important one and it's a very deep one and I won't get into all the details here around the, the growth and development of downtown Calgary. But we've re we have in Calgary a remarkably vibrant downtown core from a commercial perspective. We have one of the largest concentrations of employment in a central business district. And what we've seen uh, since March, when a lot of white collar workers have been working from home is that the downtown is dead. And so as a result, a lot of the small businesses in the downtown, uh, your dry cleaners and lunch places and so on, are suffering very, very badly uh, because those white collar workers are largely still working from home at least many days a week. And in fact, our numbers, our COVID numbers are terrible at the moment. We're well into the second wave. I don't know that we'll go to a second lockdown as we've seen in countries across Europe. Um, I don't think the political will for that is there here, but certainly a lot of the businesses will do that voluntarily now. If they've got people coming in two, three days a week, they might say we're going back to full remote now. Um, so that's a short-term problem, and we've luckily uh, had federal and provincial governments willing to spend the money needed to keep those businesses afloat. But the longer-term problem is what happens if this is a permanent shift in how people will work? I actually, in talking to many, many employers over the last few months, don't believe it will be. I believe that most employers are saying, no, there's actual real value in having people together. I believe we'll move to a world where there'll be more flexibility in work, particularly for women, because this has been a very gendered economic uh, crisis in a way we haven't seen before as well. And a lot, of, a lot of the responses from government have been based on an assumption that women can drop in and out of the workforce, which is insanity. But I believe that there will be uh, more flexibility. I believe people will work from home a day or two a week. But I also believe that people will need to go into the office and the long-term changes uh, will probably be mitigated. If they're not, then every city in North America has a huge problem because we've built a road network and a transit network and a taxation system that are based on people going to work in offices and skyscrapers. And if they don't, then we have some fundamental challenges with changing how our cities work. Thank you. One question from Istanbul, Turkey. One of my do favorite you believe, places in the world. Do you believe that local municipal level politics has more impact on change than national level politics? And 100%. To what, to what extent or how can a muni policymaker be part of change at a national level? Well, it's cliche, but it's very true that we deal with people in reality. We deal with the issues on the ground. We deal with getting rid of the waste and making sure there is clean water and electricity and that the roads work and that the transit systems work and that people can get to work and that there are green spaces that people can enjoy. 
But because we are so close to the citizen, because we're so close to the ground uh, on this work, not only does it mean the services that we provide are essential, you don't have clean water, you die. Um, but, um, you know, we run the police and the fire department, right? I always say that if the federal government disappeared, it would be a couple weeks before you noticed. Um, if your municipal government disappeared, you'd notice real quick because you'd be dead. Um, but, um, but that also gives us the opportunity, not always realized, for innovation in how government services are delivered. You know, here in Canada, at the local level, we don't have political parties. It's nonpartisan. And so we also have the ability to break free from the partisanship to be able to try new things. Now, that's hard. Public servants tend to be risk averse, and there's a reason they're risk averse, by the way. It's because the consequences of failure can be devastating. You know, a venture capitalist makes a mistake, they lose a lot of someone else's money and set up a new fund and keep going. A procurement officer at the city buying steel for a new bridge makes a mistake, people die. But it doesn't mean you have to have that same level of risk aversion on everything. And so one of my challenges as a leader is to attempt to help people find a risk tolerance with which they're comfortable and try innovating and changing things. And my challenge is that if it goes wrong and everyone's yelling and screaming in the streets, it would be so easy for me to say, well, it was this manager's fault. But at the same time, this manager is the one I'm encouraging to take risks. And so a lot of the thinking in the startup sector around fast to pilot, fast to fail, fast to succeed, are the things that we're really trying to push hard in public service, that it's hard. And I'm hoping we'll be able to get to more levels of innovation. Last question for me, um, Nahid. You, you won for the third time, your third election in October 2017. Are you going to make an announcement here today about standing for re-election? <laughs> this would be a great way to do it. Don't announce it locally, announce it in front of an international crowd. Uh, that would endear me to everyone forever. I, I, no, that I, I is the number an answer, one question I, I, I... I don't need an answer, I just need a sense of the thought process. What makes someone... Sure. Keep going. Actually, you know, that's, that's, I'm really glad you asked it that way. No one, ever, no one ever does. So we're a year out from our next election. And normally by now, I would know if I was running again. I don't actually uh, believe in eternal campaigns. Uh, I think that you should govern. And then shortly before an election, run on your record of governing. Um, but everyone's in election fever here, even though it's a year away. And so what goes into that process, right? In 2013 and 17, the process was actually very easy. There's still tons of work to do. I've got tons of energy for it. Let's move forward. The process now is a bit more difficult because uh, one has to weigh personal issues. And in fact, as I ask people their opinion, it's unanimous. Everyone says the same thing. As your friend and as a person, I want you not to run anymore because you've got to stop doing these 100-hour weeks. But as a Calgarian in the middle of all these crises going on at the same time, please don't go. It's not time to push it on. And so as a leader, this is what you always have to ask yourself. What is my selling proposition here? What do I want to do with my one precious life? And how do I want to try and make change using that life? And is what I'm doing now the right way to do it? And it's always hard as a leader to ask yourself that personal question. Well, some leaders have no problem with asking yourself the personal questions. They're typically not the great leaders. But for those whose life is built on seva, on that selflessness, and I know that sounds arrogant for me to say that, but if you're driven every day by the ability to make things better, sometimes it's hard to step back and ask yourself, is this right for me? And is this the best way for me to be doing this work? At the same time, you've got to think about your organization as well. And you have to think about, is this the moment to pass it on? And as human beings, you always want to live by the rule, leave it better than you found it. And are things better than they were 10 years ago? I think undeniably so in many ways. But this is a really rough time. It's a rough time for so many citizens. And how would I feel about leaving these citizens to their own devices uh, in a time where they really need assistance from their governments? So that's really what I'm weighing. Uh, and, you know, we'll see how the pandemic plays out. Uh, we'll see how uh, some of the strategies we put in place for economic recovery play out. 
And ultimately, I'll make a decision much later than I normally do. Um, but in the meantime, you know, invite others to think about ways that they think they could do a great job with the community. Thank you for that. Nahid, we've uh, run out of time, unfortunately. I have. God, it felt like 10 minutes. That's because I don't give short answers. 10 years and I still can't do sound bites. I have so many other questions. I feel like we've only just scratched the surface. There's so much more I'd like to know about your leadership style, about conflict, about collaboration, dealing with opponents, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I hope we'll be able to persuade you to come back um, again. Maybe I'd be happy to do a part two anytime. What a pleasure. Thank you so much, Mahi, for your time today. And thank you to the members of the audience from all over the world uh, for being here. I think as soon as you disconnect, there will be a survey that will come out, uh, that will pop up. So if everyone could please fill it up, that, that would be great. It will help us improve going forward. And Nahid, once again, thank you very much. All the best. Thank you. Take good care. Bye-bye.